Thanks so much, Peter. Can everyone hear me? Okay, I'm just going to dive in so that we have a lot of time for questions. So for 12 years now, John Lennon's song, Imagine, has been played or sung just before the ball drops on New Year's Eve in New York City's Times Square. This fledgling tradition tells us a great deal about what we might call the secular political religion of modernity. Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for, and no religion, too. If you want to understand the source of contemporary hostility to the teaching of Western civilization, I think you can find it right there. And the sentiments behind John Lennon's Imagine motivate and explain our most erudite contemporary scholarship, not just large swathes of popular culture. If you'd like a more sophisticated rendering of the same idea, consider this claim from James Burnham's prophetic 1964 book, Suicide of the West. The principal function of modern liberalism, Burnham says, is to facilitate the dissolution of Western civilization. And this suicide will be rationalized, quote, by the light of the principles of liberalism, not as a final defeat, but as a transition to a new and higher order in which mankind as a whole joins a universal civilization that has risen above parochial distinctions, divisions, and discriminations of the past." End quote. Academic history, as currently written and taught, is largely a brief for globalization. The idea is to undermine the public's sense of national or civilizational identity. With nothing left to kill or die for, the world will presumably live as one. But while imagining a future without countries may be easy if you try, Leninist historians have the vastly more difficult task of imagining a world in which nations and civilizations have never even existed in the past. Is it possible to simply imagine a nation or even an entire civilization out of existence? Well, that's exactly what deconstructionist historians attempt to do. And from their point of view, it is easy because nations and civilizations were never truly anything other than imaginary to begin with. For deconstructionist historians, every collective boundary line is a flawed human construction, susceptible to debunking and especially deserving of such treatment when it encourages an in-group identity, above all war, at the expense of a capital O, other. Over the past few decades, just about every familiar narrative in Western history has been subjected to debunking by revisionist historians. But how often have these alleged deconstructions themselves been critically examined? Well, today I'm going to talk to you of what might arguably be the granddaddy of all historical deconstructions, the claim that the idea of Western civilization itself was largely invented during World War I as a way of explaining to American soldiers why they were going to fight in Europe. Now, you may or may not have heard this claim, but a great many historians and academics have. The idea that college courses in Western civilization were actually a late and politically motivated invention played a very significant role in the debate 30 years ago over Stanford University's Western civilization requirement. And of course, the decision to eliminate Stanford's required Western civilization course helped usher in the modern era of multiculturalism at our universities and greatly accelerated the disappearance of Western civilization courses from the college curriculum as well. The scholars most responsible for moving today's K through 12 curriculum away from Western history and toward the idea of global citizenship have also been deeply influenced by this claim that the teaching and even the very idea of Western civilization 
was actually a form of 20th century war propaganda. The origin of this thesis was a 1982 article by Gilbert Allardyce, uh, A-L-L-A-R-D-Y-C-E, Gilbert Allardyce, called The Rise and Fall of the Western Civilization Course. There, Allardyce fingered not biblical Israel or Periclean Athens, but the war issues course of the World War I Student Army Training Corps as the actual birthplace of Western civilization. According to Allardyce, the war issues course taught an America once steeped in the idea of its own uniqueness to accept an alternative identity, this one highlighting the liberal democratic traditions we share with Europe. This wartime course, says Allardyce, inspired the spread of mandatory Western civilization classes throughout the nation's college curriculum in the years after World War I. Those courses flourished until the Vietnam War. Expressions were told of the alliance of the North Atlantic nations and their dominant position in the world. In sum, the Allardyce thesis suggests that Western civilization is both a recent invention and a thinly disguised form of neo-imperial war propaganda. Well, for decades, the Allardyce thesis has been elaborated by academic historians, most notably in Lawrence Levine's 1996 book, The Opening of the American Mind, a book widely hailed as the Academy's definitive rebuttal to Alan Bloom's closing of the American mind. Levine expanded on the Allardyce thesis by tracing the history of the American university from the 18th century on. Levine tells the story of the exclusion of medieval and modern history from the cl classical Greek and Latin curriculum that dominated American universities until roughly the 1870s. Even ancient history received little serious attention in the 19th century, says Levine. Since mindless drills in Latin grammar and deadening memorization exercises were, we're told, the order of the day. Levine also describes the shift in American thinking from the exceptionalism of the 18th and 19th centuries to the very different 20th century belief in a common Western civilization. So, for example, Levine quotes John Adams, warning Thomas Jefferson against importing European professors for his brand new University of Virginia. And then Levine highlights Jefferson's fears that European uh, immigrants might fail to understand or appreciate America's democratic principles. Making a point uh, continuously repeated by multiculturalist historians ever since, Levine concludes, quote, the Western Civ curriculum portrayed by conservative critics of the university in our time as apolitical and of extremely long duration was in fact neither. It was a 20th century phenomenon which had its origins in a wartime government initiative and its heyday lasted for scarcely 50 years, end quote. Yet the Allardyce thesis is mistaken and dramatically so. It's time the debunkers were debunked. American colleges and universities have been teaching Western civilization since before the revolution. The very idea of American exceptionalism makes no sense without the complementary idea of Western civilization. And the two have always been intertwined. Yes, there is a relationship between war and Western civilization, but it's far less straightforward than Allardyce suggests. And the stereotype of the mind-deadening 18th and 19th century American college curriculum turns out to be a condescending exaggeration. So it takes some digging to show that the American college curriculum has always included the teaching of what we can rightly call Western civilization. Now part of what's involved here is the rediscovery of some great and largely forgotten 
historical works. And the recovery of these neglected classics not only refutes the Allardyce thesis, it offers us a fascinating and revealing lens on our own time. It turns out, for example, that Lawrence Levine's account of American higher education in the 18th and 19th centuries is a caricature. It's true that the classical curriculum dominated that era, along with memorization, note-taking, and what were then called recitations, that is, in-class responses to instructors' questions about assigned readings. Yet until recently, we've missed the importance of what one scholar has called the, quote, informal curriculum, end quote. You see, 18th century Harvard was a poor provincial university, unable to afford the kind of specialized faculty increasingly common in Enlightenment England and Scotland. Harvard solved this problem by creating an official list of library books approved for, quote, common use, unquote, by students. Gradually, memorization and recitation were focused on mastery of introductory texts during the first two years. Juniors and seniors, in contrast, were increasingly referred by the faculty to library work guided by the so-called common use reading list. Students wrote essays drawing on this approved list of library books, the best of which became orations delivered during graduation. Now, it might seem odd at first, but the most heavily borrowed book from Harvard's library between 1773 and 1776 was a life of the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V by Scottish historian William Robertson. Of course, a biography of a powerful 16th century European monarch is post-classical European history, contra Lawrence Levine. But why should such a seemingly obscure book be so popular? Well, the popularity of Robertson's Life of Charles V is explained by its book-length introductory essay, A View of the Progress of Society in Europe from the Subversion of the Roman Empire to the Beginning of the 16th Century. Although we've forgotten it, uh, Robertson's view of the progress of society in Europe was the most popular history of Western civilization in the late 18th century and early 19th century American college curriculum. And in contrast to Lawrence Levine's claim that John Adams and Thomas Jefferson were too suspicious of foreign influence to want European history taught at America's college and universities, uh, Adams and Roberts, Adams was Robertson's greatest advocate in North America while Jefferson included Robertson's Charles V with its great introductory survey of Western history in the curriculum of the University of Virginia beginning in 1825. Harvard students in, in 1775 took more history books out of the library than any other subject, amounting to nearly half of all books borrowed that year. So Harvard's so-called common use reading list effectively incorporated post-ancient European history into the curriculum, well before the school could afford to hire away specialists in this newly emerging subject from overseas. And with Robertson's view of the progress of society in Europe, the most widely borrowed book, it appears that on the eve of the revolution, Harvard's juniors and seniors were studying Western civilization. In fact, it seems to have been the most popular subject. Meanwhile, John Witherspoon, James Madison's teacher and the president of Princeton, directed students in his moral philosophy course to supplement his lectures by borrowing Robertson and other synthetic accounts of European history and culture, like Adam Ferguson's essay on the history of civil society, the first known English language uh, publication to use the newly coined word civilization. So once you understand the significance of the 18th century's informal curriculum, not to mention Thomas Jefferson's own curricular recommendations for the University of Virginia, 
Lawrence Levine's thesis cannot stand. Now, William Robertson's brilliant account of the West development in his view of the progress of society in Europe ushered in a kind of modern historical writing we take for granted today, but that was stunningly novel at the time. Robertson mastered the idea of unintended consequences, yet did so in a way that preserved free rational choice as a powerful force in history. Robertson's core theme was the dependence of liberty and civilization on restraint. He attributed Europe's progress to balance of power politics, in which even the most powerful nations forswore the quest for universal empire that is, for the total defeat of their rivals. And as we're learning from new work on James Madison, James Madison's unpublished writings, Robertson likely had a significant effect on the development of Madison's vision of competing and balanced factions within a constitutional republic. But the greatest and most influential Western civilization textbook of the 19th century was Francois Guizot's, that's G-U-I-Z-O-T, Francois Guizot's The History of Civilization in Europe. Guizot's modern champion, the political theorist Larry Seidentop, calls this lecture series, quote, the most intelligent general history of Europe ever written, end quote. And although neither Gilbert Allardyce nor Lawrence Levine uh, know it, Guizot's history of civilization in Europe was not only the most widely used college history text in America in the 19th century, it was also read as widely as the most popular novel by the general public. And this uh, during an era in which Americans were supposedly uninterested in anyone's history but their own. Now, to illustrate the false opposition between American exceptionalism and interest in Western history, consider that Guizot's history of civilization in Europe was first injected into the required Harvard curriculum in 1839 by Jared Sparks, Harvard's first professor of history. Yet Sparks was also the main American source for Alexis de Tocqueville's thesis that America's exceptional commitment to liberty grows out of its system of local government. I suppose you could say that Tocqueville's other main source for this idea was Guizot himself, since Tocqueville's experience of listening to Guizot deliver his original lectures on the history of European civilization is what inspired him to look to America for alternatives to France's centralized bureaucratic state. In those days, America's exceptional taste for liberty was rightly understood as the development of a broader and long-standing European project. Now, Guizot's fundamental thesis is that Europe's civilization grew out of its competing centers of social power, the church, the monarchy, the aristocracy, and the urban middle class. In effect, Guizot extended Robertson's argument about the necessary balance of state power and the dangers of universal empire into the cultural realm. According to Guizot, it was the failure of the theocratic, monarchic, aristocratic, or even pure democratic principles to gain unchallenged empire over the others that ultimately guaranteed Europe's progress and freedom. And Guizot's idea became central to John Stuart Mill's defense of uh, free speech in On Liberty. Whereas early on, Mill had put his faith in what he called a clerisy, a kind of educated, secular, but quasi-religious elite that could lead social progress. Under the influence of Guizot's vision, of liberty emerging from competing social centers, Mill changed his mind. Mill eventually came to believe that the greatest threat to freedom would be the complete triumph of either the elite intellectual clerisy or the competing forces of populism. Not only low forms of populist anger 
but also educated and refined elites could threaten freedom with the lust for universal empire, an urge for total control. Mill, of course, knew Europe's educated clerisy well because he lived among them. But for his understanding of the populist counterforce to the elite clerisy, Mill looked to the rise of Jacksonianism in America. The danger, perhaps, is that in our day, both the elite and the opposing populist forces have lost their feel for liberty and for the self-restraint upon which liberty depends. Once we recover the lost 18th and 19th century history of the teaching of Western civilization, we discover that Americans were not simply taught the principles of liberty explicitly, uh, as in a catechism. Instead, those principles were woven deeply into the fabric of the ages through the teaching of Western history. And that story seared liberty into our bones by connecting us to an enduring civilization's heritage. Here is the deeper reason why the rising American generation is losing its feel for liberty. Liberty in the bones is lost when the story of the West is forgotten. All right, now that's my attempt to convey part one of the lost history of civilization, which of course is much longer in the book itself. I have far less time to give you a taste of parts two and three, so please forgive me if what I say now is even more compressed. All right, the Allardyce thesis, the claim that the very idea of Western civilization was invented as a propaganda tool of World War I, has become a taken for granted assumption of America's history profession. Beginning with the Stanford Western Civ dust up of 1987 through 1988, and continuing through the creation of the College Board's revisionist curricula in AP US history, AP European history, and AP world history, this alleged debunking of the Western tradition has been invoked by the leading lights of the history profession to justify the replacement of traditional courses in Western civilization. The scholars who've drawn upon the Allardyce thesis to replace the history of Western civilization pardon me, with the study of globalism and multiculturalism, form a kind of thread connecting the past several decades of American higher education. So by following their work, the history of the postmodern university can be traced, and the worldview of Allardyce's acolytes laid bare. Let's begin with Allardyce himself. His article indicates that he had a direct part in the collapse of the Western civilization requirement at Stanford University in the late 1960s. Through the 1950s, Western Civ was the most popular course at Stanford. By 1963 through 1966, when young Allardyce served as a teaching staffer for Western Civ, the course had entered a steep decline. Stanford's senior faculty had lost faith in the very idea of general education and implicitly, perhaps, in Western civilization itself. Teaching was wholly turned over to low-level staffers like Allardyce, who, quote, sabotaged, end quote, the common lectures and curriculum. Each discussion section was run independently according to the interests of the staffer. As Allardyce put it, quote, we thought in teaching from personal perspectives that we were deepening the course. Instead, we were digging its grave. End quote. The result was curricular anarchy. The commonality at the root of the course's appeal was gone. When students duly demanded an end to all course requirements at Stanford, Western Civ most of all, the faithless faculty surrendered. Far from expressing regret for his role in the collapse of Stanford's most loved course, Allardyce's essay announces the obsolescence of Western Civ. The course, we're told, had its moment, which was brief, historically conditioned, and decidedly untraditional. Now, says Allardyce, Western Civ is consigned to the unrecoverable past. That is, Allardyce claims he arrived at Stanford just in time to kill off a course fairly begging to be put out of its mercy. Yet in light of Allardyce's blind spots and misconstructions, it's hard not to wonder 
whether he might have been looking for a way to assuage some residual regret. Surely scholars of his generation will have valued Allardyce's reassurance that nothing of moment was at stake in the death of the old curriculum. Yes, Allardyce's claim about the so-called invention of the Western Civ course turns out to be false which undercuts the conclusions so many scholars drew and continue to draw from his thesis. More deeply, however, the perspective from which Allardyce wrote and the perspective which has come to dominate in our era, uh, the academy, leads its adherents to question the very existence of any human social reality beyond illusory constructs. Far from inspiring students, that view corrodes the soul. In its most radical form, in the writings of the immensely influential French postmodernist Michel Foucault. How many people here have heard of Foucault? Hey, a surprising number have not heard of Foucault. That's pretty good. Well done. <laughs> the immensely influential French most postmodernist Michel Foucault, constructivist thinking presumes that what is called culture or society is better understood as a system of, quote, power knowledge, end quote. How many people have heard of power knowledge? OK, fewer, but some. Such systems are neither true nor false, but are instead so-called regimes of truth, exercises in domination that both create and are created by forms of knowledge. Here, the word truth is not a discovery about the world, but a technique used by power knowledge to suppress marginal groups. From Foucault's perspective, so-called knowledge of culture or civilization can be neither accurate nor mistaken in the conventional sense. Rather, apparent cultural knowledge consists of bogus truths manufactured in the service of the dominant group. There's no real Western civilization to be described or criticized. There is only talk about civilization that serves as a tool for suppressing the purportedly less civilized. From this perspective, history itself is the continuous invention of knowledge in the service of dominant groups. It's Allardyce all the way down. Apparent knowledge of Western civilization is nothing more than a tool by means of which elites, say, send powerless young men to die in wars that advance the interests of the governing class. <clears throat> Yet Foucault's thoroughgoing skepticism puts him in a bind. His work is nothing if not political. Everything is bent toward resisting the current regime of truth on behalf of groups disadvantaged by the dominant powers. Yet on what basis can Foucault justify his political commitments, much less specify what a new regime of truth ought to look like? The very notion of a regime of truth delegitimates any possible replacement. Foucault's political commitments clearly derive from the great tradition of Western political thought. Yet from his perspective, that tradition, if it has any reality at all, is accessible solely by means of our problematic regime of truth. It's unclear how Foucault escaped that regime in order to describe and critique it, or why his truth, rather than any other, should be believed. Foucault had the benefit of training at France's finest university, the École Normale Supérieure, where he mastered the great works of the Western tradition. Foucault's political commitments and analytical framework flow directly from the great Western writers, Marx above all. Marx, in turn, drew his materialism from Epicurus, his historicism from Hegel, and much of his economics from Adam Smith, even as he repudiated their conclusions. Was Foucault hoodwinked by prior regimes of truth? when he adopted and adapted earlier ideas? Or is his own work evidence of the Western tradition's continuity? Foucault could take his political commitments for granted, leaving them dangling from a worldview that rendered the very act of justification impossible. 
Yet the opportunity provided to Foucault by his great book's education must be accounted for. To the extent that we dismiss Foucault's education as a mere machination of a regime of truth, we descend into paralyzing nihilism. Yet to the extent that Foucault's genuine mastery of the Western tradition enabled him to transform it, the educational theories of his acolytes are called into question. In that case, the Western tradition would be real, accessible across the gulf of time and social change, and a wellspring of informed choice and action, whether for better or for worse. Of course, I think for worse in this particular case, but if Foucault actually learned from the canon, then his intellectual achievement calls his nihilism into question. If Foucault was adopting the insights of his predecessors, and not just uh, their self-serving ideologies, this itself would point to the existence of truths that endure across time. Again, limitations of time prevent me from presenting you with anything like my full critique of contemporary deconstructionist history, but let me provide a specimen example in the form of a prominent historian who not only invokes the Allardyce thesis, but who has published important recent work on the direction of history as a discipline. In 2014, UCLA's Lynn Hunt, a well-known historian of the French Revolution and a former president of the American Historical Association, published Writing History in the Global Era, a brief for globalism as the history paradigm of the future. Hunt's book on globalism begins with a survey of academic history as it stands today. History is a discipline in crisis, she says, intellectual as well as budgetary. Historical paradigms from Marxism to postmodernism to identity politics have lost their vitality, says Hunt, leaving the discipline at sea. Although Hunt says Foucault's influence is unmatched, she adds that his rejection of truth, reality, and freedom now feels like a dead end. Today, Foucault's nihilism isn't so much contradicted as ignored, says Hunt. Yet nothing has taken its place. Historians, she concludes, have been, quote, better at tearing down than at rebuilding, end quote. None of this will surprise traditionalists who've been making these points for decades. Yet here's a historian on the left uh, and an acknowledged leader in the field nodding in agreement. Hunt proposes globalist history as the solution. Hunt presents globalization as a return to grand historical narrative. Now history will have a purpose. Quote, understanding our place in an increasingly interconnected world, end quote. Yet globalist history can't seem to get past square one. By Hunt's own account, no one can agree on when globalization began or how to figure that out. Answers range from early man's departure from Africa to the 1990s. The field also seems mired in a reductive materialism, which Hunt strives to overcome with limited success. The problem is that globalization, as presented by Hunt, is really only half a paradigm. The nature, extent, and value of globalization can only be assessed with reference to the nations, cultures, and civilizations it connects. Since Hunt defines globalization as a process of ever-increasing interdependence, we need to know what societies that are more and less interdependent look like. We won't be able to decide when globalization began in earnest, much less what it means or whether it's good, until we can compare nations and cultures at various stages of the globalization process. But that would require reconstruction of the very national and civilizational narratives that deconstructionist historians have been trying to debunk for decades. Globalization theory, as currently constituted, isn't a grand or purposeful narrative at all. It's merely deconstruction raised to the highest power. The globe sounds like an entity you can positively describe. 
Yet since there is no truly global society to speak of, John Lennon notwithstanding, shifting the frame of reference to the global level is simply a backdoor way of undermining national narratives. Every imported foodstuff or borrowed custom is hailed as devastating proof that supposedly distinct nations and cultures are in fact thoroughly porous and interdependent, that nationhood itself is imaginary. This repeats the 19th century anthropological fallacy of diffusionism. Diffusionist anthropologists traced the global spread of isolated cultural traits as if this was the key to social wisdom. But diffusionists failed to address the reasons why a trait adopted by one culture was not adopted by another, or why traits adapted were adapted differently in different cultures. The issue is not the origin of isolated cultural traits, but how and why those traits are knit into the complex fabric of a given society. Figuring this out requires knowledge of culture. Globalization theory is the diffusionist fallacy on a grand scale. Even granting that renewed attention to global flows might be useful, nothing of significance can be concluded about the circulation of global goods and ideas until they're assessed with reference to the national cultures they're entering and allegedly transforming. Given its current ideological commitments, history as a discipline seems decidedly ill-equipped to make this intellectual move. Writing in 2014, Hunt treated globalization as our inevitable future. Recent developments like Brexit and Trump have thrown this thesis into considerable doubt. And Hunt and her colleagues were as unprepared for them in 2016 as they were seemingly oblivious to the continuing significance of nation, culture, and civilization in 2014. All right, now that's a very brief, a very partial, and highly compressed summary of the critique of postmodern historical scholarship presented in part two of the lost history of civilization. Now, I'm not even going to try to convey the argument of part three, uh, which asserts that tracing the rise of academic deconstructionism provides a key to understanding our current cultural and political polarization. I'm going to conclude instead by simply listing the core claims of the book as a whole. First, postmodern academic skepticism and the broader collapse of faith it reflects has backed us into a corner in which inflated accusations of bigotry and genocide are virtually the only remaining sources of collective purpose. Second, postmodern academic skepticism has become a petrified orthodoxy every bit as due for critique as the Aristotelianism of Hobbes's day. Third, so-called multiculturalism isn't really about preserving traditional cultures at all. Instead, multiculturalism has ushered in a radically new sort of culture in which perpetually expanding accusations of bigotry and genocide stand as quasi-religious ends of, in themselves. And fourth, that the American experiment cannot survive without checking or reversing these trends. If you'd like to explore these broader claims in greater detail, you're welcome to read the book for yourself, the entirety of which can be downloaded for free, no money needed to go to the National Association of Scholars, at the NAS website. Thank you.